So, so welcome. I'm Mary Farley. I'm the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Public Health and Women in Sciences. And I'm delighted to see you here in person. And those of you who are joining us via Zoom, we've been having a little uh, technical difficulties, but we're, we're moving forward now. Um, and so uh, this, I wanted to just say that uh, this is our first seminar of this term when we're doing this hybrid. So I'm happy to be hoping we can coordinate this. I would like to now uh, introduce um, Laurel Kensel. Laurel is a professor in the Environmental and Occupational Health uh, Sciences program, and she has graciously agreed to actually introduce our speaker today and to moderate the session. So Laurel, take it away. Uh, thank you. Um, Do you have the speaker thing? Because they're having trouble hearing. Oh, they can't hear. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Uh, so I'll be brief since we're a little late anyway, but we're very pleased to have Dr. Bettini here. Um, he's a professor and the head of the Civil and Construction Engineering Program and does a lot of work. Um, we previously were at University of South Florida, mm -hmm. but even before that, we're as at Portland State University um, and has been involved with many um, important, I think, uh, initiatives around uh, traffic and uh, transportation. And um, he's going to talk today about uh, the built environment and um, its impact on climate, but also public health um, and the importance of built environment, which I'm a firmer believer in. I think um, a lot of times in our College of Public Health, we talk about social determinants of health. I think there are physical relationships of our physical environments that relate to that. And I also uh, should note, and I don't want to get this wrong, in 2009, he was appointed by President Obama as the Deputy Administer, Minister for Research and Innovative Technologies in the U.S. Department of Transportation. So I think he has a wide breadth of not only research, but also policy. And um, it's just wonderful to have you here at OSU. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for the kind invitation. And thanks to those of you online and those of you in person. It's really great to be here. And so today, uh, I titled the presentation, Impacts of the Built Environment on Health and Climate, a vision for collaboration, because I'd really like to think about how we can collaborate more from the engineering perspective with the, I, we have some business students here, but, and also some uh, public health experts. And so how can we think more holistically about what we're doing in our communities that drive the health of the communities from an infrastructure perspective? So. I'm going to start with a story because this just happened a few weeks ago. We had a visitor here, Professor Kai Oxhausen from ETH Zurich visited Corvallis um, the first week of the quarter. And I've known him a little bit. He's a transportation expert, transportation modeling expert. Um, but we had the chance to talk a few times and he gave a few seminars and he kept asking the question because this was his first time in Corvallis, why are the streets so wide? And, I, and I, I'm like, I don't know. I mean, every street seems to be about the same width. And, you know, so I, so this was what prompted me to kind of start today's presentation with a story because I was trying to answer a question that I couldn't answer. And, and so I, I did a little, you can't see the photos very well here for those of you in the room, but um, I first looked at Zurich, the main street, Bahnhofstrasse is the, the quote unquote most expensive street in the world. It's a shopping street. Um, the pavement there for, for vehicles is 20 feet wide. The, the, the distance between buildings, I think, is about 70 feet, so from according to Google, so uh, Google Maps. So the building faces are about 70 feet apart, and 20 feet of that is allocated really to trams. So it's a, it's a light rail or streetcar system, and the rest is for pedestrians. So from obviously Corvallis is not Zurich. We don't have a Bahnhofstrasse here, but I took a look around at some of some his, some old photos in downtown. The streets are about 54, 50 feet, 55 feet wide. And the question is, why are they so wide? I have no idea actually, but the, the interesting thing is that the distance between the buildings is about the same as in Zurich, around 70 feet or so. So that just basically means that whenever these streets were laid out, some probably in the 19th century, some more recently, um, the decision was made to allocate most of the space by far to, who knows, vehicles, horses, carts, ultimately trucks, cars, 
uh, buses, and so on. But it was an interest. I, I still don't know the answer to his question why, but at least uh, we have a little bit of a, of a starting point for a comparison. So I think it's an example of how obviously the, the street in Zurich goes back hundreds of years, probably before Corvallis, but decisions have been made over time that have really been working with the same amount of real estate, but just different decisions have been made over time to allocate space. So in a, in, in a sense, uh, it's a disappointing start to my presentation because I don't have the answer, but I think it's a good good type of question for us to remember. So um, why does street width matter? So you can think about things that happen on a street. We all probably live on a street. We're on streets all the time, um, maybe walking or driving or biking or riding uh, in, a, in a bus or another form of public transportation. So street, the wider the street, <clears throat> higher construction and maintenance costs, the crossing distance for pedestrians is longer, so it's more exposure to moving traffic. So in, in a lot of movements, in what we call a complete street movement, the emphasis is on reducing the crossing distance as narrow as possible. So sometimes you see crosswalks where they've been extended, the curbs have been extended out to the middle of the street to, to absolutely minimize the crossing distance, makes it more user-friendly, makes it safer, allows the pedestrians to be more visible and so on. So having wide, wider streets can discourage walking, biking, and use of public transportation. Actually, it, the wider streets, unnecessarily wide streets can reduce the amount of land and reduce the tax revenue for a community. Um, it encourages and requires driving in a lot of cases because everything is just farther apart. There's a clear safety impact there. Wider streets do encourage speeding. So, um, Maybe some of you read the news uh, yesterday, I think it was, uh, Secretary Buttigieg announced a new framework for safety, a national framework for safety at the US Department of Transportation. So we've seen in the last couple of years, a really, and particularly in Oregon, a terrible uh, increase in um, fatal and injury crashes. Um, not only the number, but the rate has also gone up um, dramatically in the last two years. So wide streets tend to encourage speeding, which obviously, uh, can result in fatal crashes with pedestrians. More pavement, wider streets have a heat island effect and so can negatively impact uh, you know, summer, um, summer temperatures uh, that can also be it, it cause injuries and fatalities. And then the more paved surface we have for, for streets, the more uh, stormwater runoff goes into the storm, storm drainage system that has to be treated as opposed to being absorbed by natural ground. So this I went down this rabbit hole of why, why street width matters. So lots of questions come up and it made me think a little bit about something called walk score. I don't know if you, any of you have heard of that. So it's how walkable is your neighborhood and you can type in an address. So I just did a little historical uh, memory, went down memory lane as, as far as my the house where I grew up all the way till now. Uh, the walk scores have changed a lot and you might notice there when I lived in Portland, Washington DC, and I had a sabbatical in the Netherlands, those were very super high walk score locations where they were a walker's paradise, a public transportation paradise. When I was in Delft, I could, from my door, I, it, the street was only nine feet wide, so it was, not a, it was only for pedestrians and the occasional bike, but I could walk to the train station in seven minutes and with one transfer be in Paris a couple hours later. So it was, it was this kind of seamless uh, transportation life cycle that was a dream come lifestyle that was kind of a dream come true for me. So the other thing I noted here is that a lot of the streets that I've lived on have been about 35 feet wide. And, and some of them, um, you know, were set like the one in Portland about 1910. And so that, that standard 35 to 40 foot street that kind of fits two parking lanes and two driving lanes has really not changed that much. So that, that was my kind of rabbit hole of <laughs> street width. To sort of, and that was the street in Delft that I lived on. So I think it does transition well to the broader discussion about built environment because street space is something that we all experience and that we, we all are sort of handed prior decisions that were made. So there's this famous set of photographs that have, has been done now in many, many cities about how to move 60 people, you could either have about 60 cars, you could have a bus, or you could have about 60 bicycles or some combination. But for, a, for any community, a city or even a town, the decisions that you make about how you wanna move people 
have spatial impacts, right? So obviously those cars, you can't just kind of fold them up and you know stick them, pile them up next to one another. You couldn't really park them like that because if somebody needed to get out, they would have a, a lot of difficulty getting out of that of a parking lot that looked like that. But I think that the impact of, of our choices about how we plan and, and develop the built environment, the spatial impacts that result then cause all of us to live in, uh, in, in a way that we're kind of stuck with. We don't have a choice in some cases. So the, the built environment, uh, one other example of uh, a built environment that goes beyond just street width and street space is the street network. So I've taken students to the Netherlands on a study abroad course, I think about seven times. And one place that we visit is a, is a suburban community called Houghton, which is a suburb of a city of the city of Utrecht. And this is just one example of how the city was, the network was created. So it's not a, a, a community that's unfriendly to cars. It, it's very friendly to walking, biking, and public transportation. There's a railroad station. Rail line runs right through the middle of the, of the community. This is kind of the outline of, of Houghton here. And it's hard to see on this presentation, but if you live in one of the residential neighborhoods, you can hop on your bike or walk to the center of the town within a minute or two. Especially if you have a bike and you're pretty fast, you could be to the train station, the grocery store, the city hall, the library, all the sort of the restaurants in the center in one or two minutes. If you decided to drive, you have to follow this circuitous route that would take you about 13 minutes in your car. So the way they design the network is to make it more favor to encourage walking and biking and uh, discourage the use of the car for something that you could better off be better off walking or biking. So that's just an example of not only space, but the network arrangement. This just shows by bike, you could be, be from this randomly chosen uh, location to the center in about three minutes. So <clears throat> um, I think, sorry, I'm going to go back to the beginning because I, what I wanted to say is all this thinking, all this storytelling that I've been doing has made me sort of think about three things. The built environment, it's handed to us, right? It, it was developed by someone or some group of people, decisions that were made in the past that we had nothing to do with. Built environment's meant to last for a long time. Unfortunately, there was a bridge that collapsed in Pennsylvania this morning and it was 50 years old. Most bridges are designed to last between 50 and 100 years. That's, as a civil engineer, it's a mark of, of, of pride, right? Our, our structures stand and don't fall down in earthquakes. That's kind of how we operate. So the, the, those facilities like those bridges are also carbon intensive. So the use of cement, cement is a very high, the production of cement requires heating raw materials to very high temperatures. So there's a very, the, the use of cement in concrete has a, a very large carbon footprint. We weren't involved in how the built environment was set up and we didn't get a say in that. And the decisions by generations in the past kind of leave us with a community and its health that, um, that can vary along many dimensions. Right now, I would say we have some better insights about how to design communities, but it's not everywhere, right? And not everyone has a seat at the table. And these newer ways of thinking and deciding are not institutionalized. So there are standards that are still used that are very old and do not incorporate the more uh, enlightened kind of thinking about climate and about public health. And there aren't necessarily enough incentives to shift yet, to shift to a more 21st century way of thinking. And I'm not sure there's a sense of urgency. I think there should be, and there are good things happening that, that um, give me hope, but I think there's not enough of a sense of urgency. In the future, so here we are talking today, so hopefully there will be new and more collaborations across disciplines uh, to make communities safer and healthier and more climate friendly. I think we're gonna need more and better data. We're gonna need better decision support tools for decision makers. We're gonna to need to, to be better about forecasting things that are by nature uncertain. And we all get nervous when, we're, when we deal with uncertainty, right? So um, we've been in this pandemic which has involved a lot of uncertainty and it's made a lot of us very nervous about are we doing the right thing, are we not? 
What's the outcome going to be? And in, in areas of the built environment, you know, we don't necessarily know how people will respond to something that we build or something that we provide, but we can guess and we can forecast and we can keep improving that. Okay, so then I'm gonna go here. So now zooming out and saying, let's look at the built environment through a public health lens. I'm not a public health expert, so this is where I need you to, uh, to correct me, but um, what I would say the built environment consists of are spaces, places, structures, features, and facilities created or modified by people. We can view them collectively as an environment in which people live, work, learn, and play. So a lot of, a lot of our surroundings are part of the built environment, right? So this building, someone decided how to design and build this building, the sidewalks outside that give you access to the transportation network, someone decided how to build those things. Someone decided to let the, the facilities vans sit idling on campus way every day, you know, with jet, probably diesel or gasoline powered vans. So every time I walk past one of these idling vans, I'm all like, who decided that this was a good idea, right? Couldn't we have a plug-in for an electric van and let them stay warm if that's the issue? And then anyway, that gets me down another rabbit hole talking to facilities people here because I was asking them at a renovation they're doing on Graph Hall, I said, can we stick a charging or at least stub out a conduit underground for a char future charging station? And they're like, no, we can't do that. We don't have any charging stations on campus. And I'm like, well, we should. So, so anyway, this, you know, this, this subject is one that has lots of rabbit holes. So you can start following a lot of these paths. But I think if you look at this um, public health circle, there are many areas where the built environment is involved, right? So. Um, access to nutritious food, um, physical activity, building physical activity into how we, we build the network can help in the area of health promotion, disease and injury prevention. Environmental health, obviously things that we do in transportation in the built environment affect water, they affect climate and they affect air, right? So I'll say more a little bit about, about those in a second. So I was trying to come up with, with some sort of graphical way of, of, of seeing how the built environment fits into the larger sense of the, of the you know, what is a healthy community. So I found this graphic um, it sort of starts outside with a global ecosystem, then the natural environment, and then the built environment fits in because that's what enables the activities that come from that. So it's, it's, uh, it's obviously integral but I'm not sure that we, we um, <clears throat> are open enough or that we communicate well enough across the boundaries of those little uh, rainbow elements in there. So that, that's somewhere we, where we can improve. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. So <clears throat> what are the elements? So I like to divide things up into categories. <laughs> and so that, that's kind of what works in my brain. And in transportation, this is what we do. We think about the fixed ingredients and the moving ingredients and then the systems that, that tell you how to operate them. So I tried to come up with this, uh, this graphical picture showing that there are intangible things such as laws, land use, regulation, uh, density requirements or limitations or, or yeah, desires. There are policies that exist, right, in cities and counties and states and at the national level. There's the economy, and then there's how we design things. Like, who are the people who design our communities? You know, there, many of them are probably planners and civil engineers. And all of those things fit together over at decades or centuries in some cases. Um, when I was in the Netherlands, the canal and street system there was laid out in the 1600s, right? So, and then they, they're stuck with that network. Um, uh, so those then dictate or, or contribute to how the fixed parts that include the transportation network, the buildings, parks, all the materials that are used in those ingredients, um, the utilities that are under, often underground that you don't see, that, that no one really knows how the utilities are working underground. So very often, any one of us is only kind of looking at a little sliver of one of these things, right? So there, it's, it's very rare that you have this, an overarching view of all the historical intangible elements that feed into the, the built environment that we're stuck with. Most often we might be working on one little project uh, unless we're creating an entire new city. I read that um, 
uh, Indonesia is creating a new capital city, I believe. Um, and so obviously that doesn't happen every day, but their, their goal is to create a healthy, sustainable, completely new capital. Um, so that's an, obviously an opportunity to, to be holistic. So intangible and tangible elements. Um, <clears throat> So then I was trying to think, well, what are the things, um, how, do, how do you divide up those, those tangible and intangible things and categorize them by the types of impacts? So on the left side, those are my fixed uh, tangible elements. And so those lead to uh, certainly behaviors. So how we design and how we establish the buildings, transport and the materials we use, utilities uh, and parks will either encourage or not things like physical activity, uh, healthy eating, social interactions, and recreation. So if you, if you have easy access to healthy food, and I'll, I have a map later that, that shows that there are a lot of people who don't have easy access to healthy food, um, you're much more, yeah, you're probably going to be more healthier because you have access to those ingredients. And if like when I lived in the Netherlands for my sabbatical, I could walk or bike everywhere. So kind of within like seven minutes on my bike, I could either be at the university where I worked or I could be, you know, I could walk to the train station in seven minutes. I could bike to the grocery store in about two minutes, you know, so everything that you sort of need on a day-to-day -day basis was in that sort of seven minute radius, I would say. And I didn't have a car. I, I actually never used a car for that year, but just relied on biking and, and public transportation and walking. And all those things, <clears throat> like social interaction, maybe we as civil engineers don't think of those as ingredients of, of a healthy community, but certainly they are. So allowing space and uh, opportunities for interaction is something important for our society. Then, of course, on the exposure side, and these are things where I'm not an expert, but I read and studied some, some ways of categorizing different exposures. But obviously, all of these built environment elements contribute to air quality, <clears throat> also water quality, noise, uh, safety, security, and environmental hazards. So then the, the right-hand side of this is more the public health uh, side of things, where I'm much more nervous to say anything, because I, I, I don't know as much. But clearly, there are performance metrics like obesity, um, systemic inflammation and stress that, um, that are uh, elements of physical, mental, and emotional health that could be measured or could be evaluated as part of um, the kind of the life cycle of the built environment. So just a couple of examples. There are things that you can measure. Um, there's, you can look on a map and see which counties in the United States have limited access to healthy food. So you know, you could look at no grocery store within five miles, those kinds of things. Certainly in Tampa, Florida, where I lived uh, before coming here, there were a lot of neighborhoods with very poor infrastructure. So the lower income neighborhoods had very poor infrastructure. The city of Tampa, I couldn't believe this, didn't require sidewalks for new, new buildings, new developments. I think they changed that uh, recently or the, the current mayor is trying to change that, but having sidewalks and street lighting and grocery stores in communities are really uh, kind of the basic, fulfilling basic needs to get around and to eat. Um, we also have, you can also look at a map from an air quality standpoint. Um, I think a ha about half of US citizens live in counties that, that do not meet at least one of the national air quality standards. You don't really see that in the news. I think in the 1970s, you would hear about smog a lot and you would see these horrible photos of Los Angeles with smog, but still 150 million people are living in a community where one or more air quality standards are not being met, but you never hear about that. There's no sense of urgency there, but that's something that, that what we have done, to, we've created an environment in a, in a society where that's happening. Uh, obesity rates and also traffic fatalities, as I mentioned before, traffic um, fatalities have been going up. So some of these things you can actually measure and pretty easily get an understanding that, you know, things are are happening. Uh, things are happening in a in a not uniform, maybe inequitable way across the country. So basically, the point is where you happen to live or work 
or where you happen even to be born can have a, a more negative impact on your health than somebody else randomly being born in another place, which just means that we're not treating our fellow citizens uh, fairly. So I could just briefly say that there, there's a consensus now that the built environment has a lot of problems. Just the infrastructure, again, this is civil engineering, civil engineers scoring the infrastructure. So it's kind of it's kind of like the Academy Awards where you know we're voting on ourselves. But we consistently give low grades to ourselves about the quality of the infrastructure. And that was something I think that has driven the, more, the most recent infrastructure package that passed uh, Congress that the president signed that will be bringing some more funding to the built environment. And I think at least in the area of transportation where I'm familiar, there will be some better ways of uh, incentivizing communities to use these funds to create uh, healthier communities. Uh, one little factoid is that uh, transportation, the area that I work in, um, we account for about one third of the greenhouse gas emissions that our country emits and also um, energy consumption. So <clears throat> we're disproportionate, I think we're disproportionately responsible for a big chunk of the, the, the CO2. Plus, obviously, I talked about safety before a little bit, but this kind of always has made me feel like we have an extra special responsibility to find ways to produce cleaner transportation and healthier transportation. And um, a lot of people have been trying to do that for a long time. Uh, as was mentioned before, I served in the o Obama administration and I remember, so that was 2009, we, had we were just coming out of a really, really, you're too young to, re to remember probably, but there was a very large financial crisis that took us about 10 years to get out of. And so there, it so happened there had been this study going on called Moving Cooler. So there was a lot of discussion back at that time, and a lot of it was happening here in Oregon too, about how can we really cut back our CO2 emissions and go back to the 1990 level. So there was, there, you know, every, there was no national policy, but every state, every city, every county, every university you know, started signing climate pledges, and um, it, there was a big emphasis on that. It, it so happened that that a study called Moving Cooler was done, and you can find it online. It's kind of it was kind of removed, and someone had posted it. I found a, a, a version of it uh, a couple of days ago, but what they were saying was really to get emissions back to the 1990 level, you would need to do a lot of aggressive things, and a lot of aggressive things that would be very politically unpopular, like pricing. So right now. Does anyone know how do we pay for transportation? See the road transportation. So it's a bunch of different taxes. Uh, so it's gas, we pay a gas tax at the pump when we buy gasoline, but we also pay property tax in some places, sales tax, uh, vehicle registration tax, licensing tax. It's a whole mix of taxes. There are some individual told, told facilities around the United States, some bridges, some tunnels, some roads, where you pay kind of by how, how long, like if you're driving on a toll road for two miles, you pay twice as much as you would pay for, for being on it for one mile. So you kind of pay as you go. But tolling is not something that people, you know, they, they don't really like, right? Because they think, well, these roads are already here. We already paid for them. Why do we need to, you know, to pay a toll? Oregon has been kind of leading the discussion of moving from a tax-based system to a mileage-based system. So there are drivers here in Oregon who have uh, uh, set up with, uh, with ODOT, the mechanism to pay by, by the distance they travel rather than by the number of gallons they consume. So that's probably a whole separate topic, but I just wanted to say that there was a, there was a lot of hope that if you did some aggressive uh, tolling and pricing of transportation that you could, you could pull back the emissions uh, in kind of the late 2000s back to the 1990 level, but you had to do a lot from the modeling that was done. And so we haven't, no one really wanted to talk about new taxes back in um, 2009. So that was, was put on the shelf, but we kind of know what we need to do if we really want um, to, to uh, reduce emissions in transportation, but politically and socially, it hasn't been feasible. You can look at the built environment. For some reason, I like these diagrams that show um, all the energy consumption and then how it's translated to emissions on the right hand side. So transportation, as I said, is a big part of it, but buildings, construction and waste are big 
big parts of this as well. So you can see that the built environment contributes uh, a significant uh, percentage to uh, obviously energy use and emissions that are associated with that. So it kind of says to me, we've got work to do, but also that's an opportunity for younger generation, uh, future professionals uh, to have a lot, a lot of responsibility once you graduate. So um, I think there are some, some many exciting things that can be done. There have also been a lot of um, analysis of what are the most kind of uh, the lowest hanging fruit for how to abate greenhouse gas emissions. And so there are there, these curves get produced every once in a while about the things that are relatively easy to do that ha can have a big impact. So low cost things that you can do that have a big impact on emissions. And then of course there are other much more expensive things that you can do that would also have an impact on emissions. But it seems to me that even at our local community level, even here on campus, we could do things that, that would not cost that much, but could have a big impact on uh, reducing emissions and, and um, creating a healthier community. So then I was thinking about how were decisions made about the built environment in the past? I lived in Portland for quite a long time and there are some famous stories about Portland, how they toured, they had a, a freeway along the uh, west side of the Willamette River that is now a park, but people then forget to say, well, then they built a freeway on the other side of the river to replace it. And it's, it, if you've walked, if you've ever walked around there, you can, there's a, a wonderful walk around the river on the esplanade on the east side it's not too pleasant having this freeway right above your head but for whatever reason there, there were decisions that were made about freeways in particular in the 1950s that were mostly aimed at increasing speed so we want people to be able to speed across the country from one city to the other and this was for defense purposes this was for uh, economic development purposes after world war ii and I heard these stories from one of my professors in grad school who was kind of involved in this in the 50s. And he was, he was a very, um, William Garrison was his name. He was very staunchly opposed to these free, interstate freeways. He thought they should end at the, at the outskirts of the cities, right? And so what happened was most of them have plowed through the cities instead. And he, he was very opposed to that. Um, but the decision was made to plow through the cities and it was very complicated. Uh, but the main thing driving that was to speed up traffic and to speed up um, commerce um, across the country and through the cities. And also to maximize the use of federal funds. Federal funds were available to states, they could use them. They didn't have to bring much funding to the table. So this is just me saying the main three dri drivers before of uh, decisions about the built environment on a big scale was really maximize speed, maximize the use of somebody else's funding and minimize costs. So, so optimize your, the cost of your project um, to make the, the best use of, of those funds. I would say that at that time, there was no consideration of a life cycle really. They realized, okay, yeah, somebody's gonna have to maintain these facilities in the future, but there wasn't a lot of thinking about life cycle cost or anything like that. Nowadays, when you think about the built environment, uh, Obviously, safe, safety is number one. So we want our facilities, let's talk mostly about transportation, but about uh, buildings as well. We, we think a little bit more about reliable. We want the network to be able to operate under much, uh, a much wider range of circumstances. So we want it to operate still on a snow day, you know, with a couple of feet of snow on the ground. And we want it to operate, you know, on a, uh, let's say, low traffic time, like three in the morning on a, on a Wednesday night or something like that. We want the, the system to be able to react to a wide swinging uh, ranges of conditions. Uh, you know, a Super Bowl being hosted in a community, we still want the transportation system to work uh, and we want the system to work uh, as an evacuation. We want the roads to work as an evacuation route for wildfires and things like that. So we're demanding more in terms of the swing of high demand and low demand from our facilities. We, are, we now are saying we want transportation and, and society to be more accessible to all. We're probably, we're getting better in that area, not only physically accessible for people with disabilities, but also it would be nice if you had a public transportation option um, where you happen to live. We would like the network to be more connected. Um, I mentioned equity. 
we are talking more about health. I think there are um, there are public health related criteria that can be used in transportation and infrastructure projects like health in all policies. I'm not an expert in those, and I think they're not being used uniformly. We can think about and model and forecast um, impact on emissions and climate. Certainly we can um, base decisions on um, energy consumption. Anyway, a few more things. We are thinking a little bit more about life cycle costs and economic development where we're thinking more that, that the built environment is, is in a cycle, right? So you may, I think I, I said, you're, you're planning, you're designing, you're building, you're operating, you're maintaining, and maybe you're even taking down part of the built environment at some future time. So removing the built environment, we never thought about that before, but there are cities in the US that have been shrinking and so like in Detroit and some, some cities in the sort of Northeast, and I know that planners have been talking about, well, how do you shrink a city efficiently? Do you, do you just let it go or do you decide, well, okay, this ring of the city we're going to abandon and convert to parks or do you sort of let, do you let neighborhoods fail or die or do you do it in some sort of proactive way? It's not something we've had to think, of, think about before. So I guess I wanted to transition to what is the role of research and education in, in what I think is a transformation that we need to make. So obviously here at the university, hopefully we're thinking about ideas and we're conducting research that might result in, in something that gets actually implemented. And a lot of the things um, that could come out of research, and I'm sorry, I have to move this a little bit. I guess we've been talking about how do we create policies that can support better decision-making, um, provide decision support. I mean, this is, not, this is not a new idea that research can result in um, better decisions, uh, but we might also be able to come up with better materials, um, with better technical and design standards. This is something that, that in uh, the School of Civil and Construction Engineering we're doing. Um, you know, government agencies, how do, you, how do you meet a standard? Well, you have to, to be able to purchase either services or materials or products. Uh, so helping cities and counties, which are usually smaller than states and national uh, governmental entities help develop procurement guidance so that new innovative, maybe lower carbon materials can actually be uh, used in a public project. Uh, and many more things, um, including what I would call culture change at the end. So hopefully we can contribute to that. And just give a couple examples of, of things that we're working on here at Oregon State. Um, in the area of materials, I've mentioned that a couple of times, we do use a lot of cement. Cement is a very high carbon intensive uh, product. 8% um, of the nation's CO2 emissions. I think about a year ago, I arrived in, Corvallis in September of 2020, I think about a year ago, early 2021, on NPR in the morning, they interviewed Bill Gates, and he was talking about the carbon footprint of cement. And I was thinking, don't we do this? And so I sent a few emails, you know, why aren't we talking more if Bill Gates, that was sort of before uh, his, the, the negative stuff started coming out about him. But I was like, if Bill Gates is talking about this on NPR in the morning, you know, we should be talking about it a little bit more. So, um, we have been um, actually just uh, the, a day or two ago, Caltrans, based on a project that was done by my colleagues here at Oregon State, they approved the use of a low carbon cement to help combat climate change. And this, the use of this cement um, will have the equivalent in one year of removing more than 6,000 cars from the road. So one little ingredient, more efficient ingredient of the built environment for one state can do more than basically removing 6,000 cars from the road. So it's, it's mind boggling to me that, you know, a research project can lead to, you know, uh, a result that can turn into policy like this. So it's, it's pretty exciting. And in, health, in the area of healthy buildings, um, we have a relatively new program in architectural engineering in our school. And we now have three faculty um, buildings account for about 40% of the nation's energy use, and we spend about 87% of our time indoors. So how we design buildings is 
has changed a lot over time. So I don't know that this is, seems like a very new building. There are some older buildings around. Uh, I work in an, in an old building from about 1900, but it's been renovated and it's, you know, it's beautiful inside. But you can see how things have changed when you just look around the campus at, at you know, buildings from different generations. But it's wonderful that we have people now who are focused on the acoustics, on um, the HVAC systems, on lighting in particular. So we're, we're going to be doing some really interesting research on uh, lighting, uh, not, only, not only artificial light, but natural light. We have a new uh, lighting classroom laboratory uh, under construction in Owen Hall that, that will allow us to explore the most uh, up-to-date types of lighting for, for buildings. So we're very excited about that. Um, also in the area of clean and safe water, uh, we have faculty who have been working uh, collaboratively across different units on the campus, not only from our school, but there's a, a stormwater treatment facility that's just off campus that uh, collaboration with Benton County where faculty and students have been testing different ways of, of treating stormwater before it makes it into uh, the Willamette River, for example. And so obviously clean water is a big global challenge that is strongly impacted by decisions that we make in the built environment. So infrastructure resilience is something. So I mentioned this, this point that the infrastructure is, is being demanded to do much more under, under much more extreme types of circumstances. So we have faculty working at the Hinsdale Wave Lab uh, on understanding coastal hazards. We have a faculty member who is in, um, in uh, is it Indiana? I'm sorry, where those horrible fires, uh, where, where were those fires? Colorado, maybe? Yeah. Yes, Colorado. So Indiana was the tornado. Uh, but we have a faculty member and some students in Colorado right now trying to assess uh, the patterns and the impacts of wildfires on those communities so that you could design communities to be more res resistant to wildfires. Um, as I mentioned, we've been doing a lot of work on evacuation as well. So um, it's, a, it's a very interesting challenge because we want the, the, the infrastructure to do more for us under these very extreme types of circumstances. And uh, that's something that we haven't, haven't faced before. We also do a lot of work in safety, construction safety, work zone safety, driving, cycling. Uh, we have a driving simulator uh, that, that also includes a bicycle, commercial truck and will next include uh, construction work zone um, simulation capabilities. And so a lot of those research projects are leading to better standards and better designs uh, for our, our intersections, for example. I was involved in one project, just very, I'll just very briefly mention it. Um, so in Florida, they're still building lots of new freeways and um, they're, they're in the process of basically widening a giant freeway system that goes through Tampa and connects to St. Petersburg. So we had a student who did some air quality modeling who was looking at uh, the impacts of this project called Tampa Bay Next. And generally when you build a project that increases the speeds, you can usually say that air quality will get better because you've got, because it's a very strange thing about internal combustion engines that if you're optimizing the speed, they on that facility, they actually have lower emissions. But what we found was that the, the disparities on where people live and how, how the, uh, beyond just the facilities, so looking at the community that's influenced by the air quality, the ethnicity disparities in, air, in NOx emissions um, was not, were not eliminated. They were reduced a little bit, but the emission rates would go up during the peak hours and the exposure disparities by race and income would also go up. So, you know, the DOT wants to build this freeway and they want to say air quality is going to get better, but when you dig into the details, it's not really uh, true from, from an equity standpoint. And we need to be better at requiring these kinds of analyses to be done. So I think um, I was just going to close by saying maybe what we need to do is develop some better tools. And I mentioned some of the different performance measures. So I'm kind of thinking of this as a, as a, as a mixing bowl where in order to determine the benefits of our projects, not only do we need to consider safety and access and climate, but also equity and health and developing better, better tools like this sort of mixing pot um, is something that you can all be involved with. 
And I think I will end by just saying that uh, the earth can live without us, but we cannot live without the earth. So with that in mind, I'd be happy to have some discussion or questions. Thank you again for the opportunity. I don't think the phone Zoom can hear me. So oh, okay. Sure. Well, you, if anyone in the audience yes. has any questions, I welcome that, and I, we will monitor Great. that. And I'll Great. Okay. Say about loud. Super. Speech, but you can do that. So, are there any questions? How does like, would you say like land zoning mm -hmm. impact like city design? Uh, it's really it's it's the the basis for a lot so and there are people who study that and there you know there are differences um i think houston texas is famous for not having any zoning but zoning is usually controlled at the local level with some usually with like a state uh some state authority so oregon has been famous for having land use regulations that have required cities and communities to develop slightly differently than they have in other states to have a urban growth boundary that is very publicly debated when it's expanded and so um, you can do a lot through zoning and there are, there are a lot of people who study that but certainly that's kind of the, the it's the blueprint kind of for how your community how your city is going to grow and so i don't know if any of you have ever been to a city council meeting or a city planning commission meeting. I was a city planning commissioner once for a couple of years, and it's really fascinating. And I, nowadays they're much more accessible because they're they're available, you know, on online to participate in. But little decisions that happen in those forums have obviously impacts for generations and have Im impact us now, right? The street widths and the the land uses that are allowed. Um, definitely define what our community looks and feels like and how we interact with it. We do have a question. Great. Uh, and again, I don't think you can hear me from the microphone. Hi, Rob. Great oh, oh, thank this you. Very high step. OK, thank you. Uh, how do you see autonomous vehicles potentially changing the story around transportation, social okay. environment, and public health? Sure. So the question about autonomous vehicles, I guess, honestly, I have mixed feelings about autonomous vehicles. And also, there's a lot of hype about autonomous vehicles. So I could, again, talk for another hour, but just about that. But to me, there's a, so automation is kind of the word I would use. Automation is something that has been happening in our society for a long time. So increasing levels of automation in different arenas, right? In manufacturing, in logistics. Uh, and there are automated vehicles that are at work today at ports, in mines, in agricultural areas. One of my students' uh, family has a farm in Eugene, and he said it's all automated. All the farm equipment is is using GPS, and is you know they're not there's no operator in those vehicles. In addition, human operated vehicles are also incorporating increasing amounts of automation and. Um, Newer vehicles that are available on the market today have a lot of safety features. They have um, sensors all the way around, video sensors and other types of sensors that some of you have probably seen or experienced those. Maybe the students, might, you might not have the most new vehicles yet, but uh, you know there are crash warning systems, crash avoidance systems in my car. If I'm on the freeway, I can take my hands and feet off and it, it will drive itself and actually stay in the lane and and it will decelerate in congestion and, and accelerate. So, so to me, I think if those features can be shown to be beneficial overall, I don't think we know if they are because we don't, they aren't standardized. Um, every manufacturer has, has a different standard. So I think to answer Perry's question quickly, it's the jury is still out and it's a huge, we have a huge opportunity to make sure that automation and transportation does actually help. I think it, it probably, like many things, would have unintended consequences. So there are lots of scenarios that you can think of about uh, you know, how, uh, how an autonomous vehicle can be used for good, but also for ill. And so you know, do we want, and I guess that picture I showed at the beginning that showed the 60 cars and the 60 bus passengers and the 60 bikes, there's another version of that that says, you know, 60 human powered cars, 60 autonomous cars, 60, 60 Ubers. And so it's still cars, right? And so it, I think automation, if it's used for good to improve safety, 
to improve accessibility. One of the first uh, Google car videos that they made was for uh, was showing a gentleman who is vision impaired. It showed him being able to go about to go to the dry cleaners and do a drive through for a taco and stuff like that. So I see it if you again, if used for good, wonderful opportunities, but I'm afraid there are some, you know, some concerns that I have over going too far in that direction. I totally agree. I think we should go public transportation rather than each of us. Yes, our yes. And fortunately, <laughs> I mean, fortunately, um, this was something that that uh, that I just happened to read about a couple of days ago, but but I was always worried that uh, the public transportation industry was not a part of the conversation. But more and more, I think some bus manufacturers are now saying we're going to incorporate the at least these safety ingredients like like our in cars that are on the market today, crash warning and um, sensors. So I think those are going to be, be creeping in to make public transportation safer too. Yeah. One more question. Where does waste and potential recycling come in this complex system? Yeah, so I think I showed, so thank you. That's a very important question. We, yeah, the, the use of, uh, so in the life cycle of the built environment, there was kind of a waste and recycling element in one of the slides that, that I didn't really dwell on, but obviously decisions we make about material use, some materials can very easily be recycled, some not. So, and some people would say, well, it's more expensive to you know, carefully dismantle something that you're tearing down. So building in to the construction of an element of built environment, the fact that it might need to be taken apart later is definitely, in my mind, something that we need to do in that life cycle, that life cycle type of thinking. So make the facility, if it's meant to be temporary, or if it's meant to last 100 years, it should be easily recyclable, and the we should consider the impacts on the waste stream when we're when we're planning them and designing them. Awesome. Not easy to do necessarily, but <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions from here? I don't want to only focus. Right. Yes. Since we're at the I understand your expertise and your interest in transportation. But yeah. When I think of the built environment, I, another element that you speaking of is the, that also one of the things I think is most um, um, uh, very different in the European cities, mm -hmm. but we're in Southern Europe and your cities is the, the existence of, of the public square. Yes. Of the plaza. Yeah. Where people gather. Yeah. And going back to the social determinants yeah. that Roy was mentioned earlier, right? And mm -hmm. how that's where you create the social, mm -hmm. the, the, the uh, creating a built environment that promotes mm -hmm. social cohesion. Right. And, and people gathering together, not just the transportation issues that you, you discussed, but also how, uh, you know, this, uh, this type of built environment can improve the Absolutely. mental health of the community. Absolutely. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I I was thinking about that um, in one of the one of the diagrams that I had that um, that obviously recreation is something maybe that we don't speak about enough that we need to make sure that that you know that we all have healthy uh, lifestyles that allow us to interact and to uh, be involved in, in recreation enjoyment. And um, you know, communities can be designed in ways that promote that or that don't. And I think the the stereotypical American suburb <laughs> with automatic garage door openers, uh, everyone you know pulls into their uh, two or three or four car garage and then shuts the door behind them, and then you know they're facing inward, right? So the the style of uh, development is an inward facing style. Really, the yards have been shrinking over time. This goes back to my planning commission days where the, the real estate developers really wanted like zero lot lines. And so the, the, the houses were designed to be inward focused instead of outwardly focused. And there's been a lot, of, a, a lot of thought about how to design communities with front porches. Um, you know, the garage might be in the back on an alley or something like that, very narrow street with uh, to encourage walking and, and cycling. Um, so. I don't really know. I mean, my cousin was a real estate developer for a while, and he and I had some arguments about this, you know. And the, so there, there are things that are sort of brought forward, like a cookie cutter, uh, cookie cutter community design, that can just happen 
you know, if the community, the city council planning commission, and if the citizens aren't involved in making sure that designs are included that are, you know, more forward thinking. So I guess it probably comes down to just uh, needing incentives perhaps to encourage that. Cause some people, they argue that it costs more, you know, this, there's a lot of literature on transit oriented development where the idea is uh, transit oriented development costs more if you're gonna have retail on the first floor, um, if you're gonna have restaurants cause the HVAC system has to take the smells away from anyone who lives above, you know, simple, I mean, simple yet important things like that. So I know that in the Portland region, the uh, Metro uh, MPO there has subsidized um, transit oriented developments to try to reduce that differential. So it's basically an incentive for that kind of development. So I think there are many types of policies and designs that have been proven to work uh, for communities. But again, I guess you need, uh, it's a top down, bottom up in all these things. I think you need, you need people to get involved, but you also need leadership uh, who can, can take on the vision and, and, and make something happen and bring people along. So I think uh, I was, I recently saw uh, a vision for Campus Way that uh, the Dean of Engineering is planning a kind of a, a study of this triangle, engineering triangle, they call it, which we're right on the, on one end of it. And that, because I've been thinking, why is Campus Way so awful for bikes and pedestrians? It's a little skinny sidewalk. So this is something that's in the master plan to improve this corridor, to make it more pedestrian and bike friendly. Uh, so we, it's something you can all be involved with uh, impacting uh, here on your campus. Since uh, you kind of brought it back here, yeah. we only have one minute left. Yeah, sure. But I'm on the faculty for carbon neutrality. Oh, yes. I'd like to get to that. Yes. So I'm curious if you have advice for <clears throat> students or even faculty, just the OSU community, how can yes. we truly get to carbon neutral yes. quickly as a university and this community? Well, I definitely, I'm glad you're on that committee. I think Jason Weiss, my colleague who did the cement uh, research, he's on that committee too. So I'd encourage you all to get involved in that. We, the colleagues who I've met, uh, the transportation, uh, we've been working with the transportation uh, office on uh, bike safety. So we've been giving out bike lights and um, talking about, you know, an doing some analysis of bike commuting uh, behavior to make biking more, um, uh, popular and more and make it easier and safer. I think um, I've talked with Paul Odenthal, who's a associate vice president who oversees all facilities, and he is totally on board with this. After I told him about the electric vehicle charging station thing, he was very disappointed. And he told me that they have actually, when he came a few years ago, we had no electric vehicles on campus. And now I believe he has specified, or I don't know if they've purchased yet, the first couple of electric vehicles for use on the campus. And it's, he said it's definitely a priority for him developing a, a charging station plan for the campus. So I think we just all need to, we all just need to band together and work together to make it happen. I think we've got people who really want to accomplish great things. And I think it would be great for for our community, great for our students, great for everyone. Well, right back at you. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you very I'm much. I'm so glad that you're focusing on this. It was a great talk. Thank so you very much for the invitation. Really appreciate it.